Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lily. I am a social worker um, for Child Protective Services or um, it's called DCSF or uh, CWS, CPS. Um, and I made this channel to just talk about my feelings, my process and my mental health treatment. And I'm recording these videos to go over um, cases that have been on the media you know i don't have any personal involvement i just have the information that's available to the public but i wanted to add in my um you know my own experience my own perspective to try to help people understand what happens in these situations okay so tyler james walter was uh 22 months old when the actually i'm not sure if it's when he was removed from the mother or when he passed away but he was just short of two years old um, there was a drug raid at the mom's home and she was arrested, so he needed to come into custody. None of the articles I read have any mention of the father. Um, he was taken into foster care for about a month. Mom had initially asked for the grandmother to be the one to take care of him. And um, when that didn't happen, she suggested a cousin, a 19-year-old cousin that lived out of town. She lived about two months away. Um they do the articles don't provide the name of, of this cousin um because she was never charged with anything so um we'll just call her cousin or caregiver sometimes on my switch because i forget i in work i usually call them caregivers the caregiver that was evaluated was the cousin um there was also a girlfriend and they lived in a home that was a child care he went at the end of july they did a, a, a scheduled, the social worker did a scheduled visit uh, to the home that had the childcare to see the, the child on August 29. And then another scheduled visit on September 21st. Now, when they went out on September 21st, the social worker noticed that Tyler had a bruise on his cheek and a little scraper next to it. Um, the cousin explained he had, um, an accident with a tricycle, um, and it was just, you know, they explained it as a normal childhood injury that just happens sometimes. And it was left at that. They also mentioned that, um, he had been to the ER due to being very fussy and not wanting to eat. Um, but she was not able to follow up with the pediatrician because she was having trouble with the child's insurance. Um, that was all that was said at that time. And the following day, he died. Now, the social worker, once the social worker leaves the home, goes back to her. Remember, he's living uh, about two hours away, but the case is still in the original county. Um, the next day, or I, actually, it doesn't say when, but when the social worker found out, it's because she got the call from the homicide detectives. And they told the social worker, uh, Tyler had not been living in that home. Uh, the cousin who's the caregiver, Tyler, and another adult, I don't, it doesn't say if it's a girlfriend or someone else, had been living out of their car for at least a week because they were evicted from that home. Now, I don't know if there was another person living in that home, like the homeowner, or, you know, it, it in the beginning it made it sound like it was their home, and there's a, I don't know why, why the dimension of the child care center, you know, whatever. But so they were living in the car. Um, the morning that the child died, he was being by, babysat by the caregiver's friend, by the cousin's friend. Uh, and he was described to be hot, fussy the whole day. Um, later in the day, he was in the back, uh, in the back seat, in his car seat, when the um, cousin was smoking marijuana in the front with the windows down. She noticed. Um, that he was slumped over, uh, took him out, did CPR, um, called the paramedics. They took him to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead. Now, I do know that paramedics are not able to pronounce you dead at the scene. It needs to be a doctor. So I don't think he was revived from the car, you know, from the call to being um, taken to the hospital. I think it's just, it, it's put that way because the, the doctors at the hospital are the ones that are able to pronounce you dead. The cause of death was um, blonde head trauma, but there was no manner of death, meaning that they didn't say it's homicide, it was an accident. Um, 
well, it was obviously not natural causes. Those are the three ways that could be the manner of, of death. So this is where I wanted to separate the, the videos. Because, so now we're looking at could have possibly been an accident. Uh, why, why did this child um, that's in care of the state living in a car with a 19-year-old that's doing drugs when he was taken out of his mom's care for doing drugs? So this information, a lot of the information comes from the mom's filing of the lawsuit. Um, I was not able to read the lawsuit itself, but I, I read a couple articles and saw a little news clip. So what mom claims is that the social workers refused to place the child with grandma. We don't know why they refused, but the social workers refused to give the child to grandma. The social workers decided to give the child to the cousin to punish punish mom so that mom would not be able to visit with this child which is part of her reunification case with child welfare to be able to get him back um and also that how could child welfare consider mom the, the cousin living in the car an appropriate placement for this child so this is where i, where I wanted to say side with the social workers and say hey, hey hold on uh first of all I'm pretty sure nobody knew about the car situation because the day before the social worker went to the home where the social worker thought they were living. If the family lies to us, we, you know, we, we do what we can with the, with the information that we have at, at the time. If mom thought this cousin was trustworthy enough to provide her information to be evaluated for the child to be in this home, there was no reason um, to be mistrustful. So let's go over how, how, how is that relative clear? What's the process like? So back in the day, it used to be the relative home assessment, RHA. Um, and we would just go check, you know, we always do background checks, make sure there's, um, of all of the adults in the home, uh, make sure the home is physically safe, make sure there's a bed, and there's a whole lot of state requirements that every county has to comply with. We were doing a lot of um, clearing relatives based on these standards, but then by the time then the case would move along, it would go to adoptions, and then the adoption standards that are higher would not be able to be met, and then we're stuck with these children that have been a significant period of time in a home that now cannot be cleared to adopt them. So a few years ago, the state changed that process and now it's RFA, Resource Family Approval, so that foster homes and relative homes have the same qualifications, have the same training, uh, the same standard, and are approved and are able to be approved for adoptions um, once we get to that step, that step. So of course, this made the process a lot more difficult, a lot longer. So then they came up with a way to do an emergency clearance and a standard clearance or approval. So the difference is for the, um, for the emergency clearance, and they call it clearance because it's not fully approved, because it's just based on an emergency. So for the emergency clearance, we have 90 days to get the home fully approved, but they can do background checks, the home checks, do the preliminary stuff up front within the next two the first two three days and then the child can go home while they do the rest of the paperwork while they do the foster care classes the training classes um it's only available to people that have no criminal history no child welfare history no child abuse history or very minimal history that is very easily explained and there's not a lot of paperwork involved so my thinking in this situation is that they knew grandma wouldn't pass that standard or it would, she would have to go on the long term. Um, maybe grandma didn't want to do it. We don't know why. Um, but mom did name this cousin. Mom was okay with this cousin being evaluated for placement. And relatives do have priority over foster homes. And it is, uh, at least where I work, it is our goal to have as many of these uh, as many of our foster kids in relative homes or familiar homes to them so we count family friends neighbors coaches um, teachers 
kind of in the same section as relatives um, just because the child already has that connection with them um, and um, it's, it's just a more familiar environment um, which tends to help the child um, with the trauma of not being with the parents but it also helps the parent um, you know work with somebody they know that they could have a little bit more trust with than a random stranger so that's what we that's why we do so now here the the what is not clear to me is whether this relative was evaluated by the original county or if they were approved by where they live because we do have um the other county is supposed to help with the evaluation except in the nearby counties so if it's you know a short drive for you it makes more sense for you to go do it instead of have a whole other system involved um but there is an in-between county and it was less than a, than a two-hour drive so i'm not sure sometimes they do sometimes they don't depends on the mood of the person that we're sending the request um so there that's that's that um and some counties have like a working relationship already because you know you will do the ones in this area but you do the ones in this area like for counties that are bigger like la right um which is where where this child was living so that's the thing the other part with them living in the car when they were evaluated they were not living in the car they had the time the child was taken to the home and two other visits where the social worker went to the home now it doesn't say if it was the same social worker all the times because sometimes we do cover for each other or the case is transferred so i'm not sure um if that would have to play a role in that but they did go to the home now my question here is you know let me answer the question here before I go into my question. Was it wrong for the social workers to send this child with a relative out of county? I don't think so. Was it wrong that this person was 19 years old? I don't know. Uh, that I'm sure that's taken into account. We don't discriminate based on age. Um, and anybody over 18 can apply. And that's, there's always supposed to be a meeting because I do, I do get it sometimes they don't happen, but they're supposed to have a meeting where the family discusses what would be the best plan for the child and then move accordingly. The smoking marijuana, I don't think that there was, there, there would have been any mention of that before. Um, it's, you know, if it's not reported, it's very difficult for the social worker to know. That one, so many people have a mar uh, medical marijuana license. Um, it's not, you know, I don't think she would have been cleared if we knew or it would have been a, a more of a longer conversation. Um, definitely n not doing it around the child. No, it doesn't matter that the windows were down. But at the end of the day, I don't, we, there's no information that that was the cause of this incident. Those, those things, I, I think so far there, we're, we're okay with the liability part. You know, who's responsible for this? I think up to that part, things have been falling into place like they usually do. Now, my concern is both of the visits that happened after the child went to live there. So both were scheduled. We are supposed to do scheduled and unannounced visits, announced and unannounced, uh, so that we can get a true view of what is going on in the family. The other thing is when we don't go to a home, you know, we don't check every single drawer to make sure their clothes are there, the toys or whatever, you know, but we do have to check, especially with a child that's not verbal, um, which it doesn't say specifically yes or no, but if he's less than two years old, he's not talking very much if he does at all. Um, we need to make sure they have enough clothes, supplies, because they're probably still in diapers. They might still be drinking bottles. Um, Close toys, a uh, safe sleeping space. I don't know if this child would have been on a crib or on a toddler bed, but we do check those. So if it's a home I go to all the time, sometimes I'll just take a peek to make sure nothing's changed. Um, especially with little kids, like I'll have them just show me, like show me you have formula, you know, where you keep things, just do a quick walkthrough of the house. Like I said, you know, I don't check every single drawer, but just you can generally tell if they had been kicked out and not living there. I don't know if that, you know, it's only a week, so stuff might have still been there. 
I don't know. It sounds like they got kicked out, but they still made them the favor to meet there so that it looked like they were still living in the home. My main issue is with the bruise on the face. So, yes. There are general childhood bruises that we are not concerned of. And those are usually scrapes on the knees. I know toddlers bump their heads a lot. I have a toddler. <laughs> I have two kids. I know. It, it, they just fall nonstop. But with children that are not verbal, the, the at least in, 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 in where I work, our policy is any child that has an injury to the head, face, or torso that is under... I'm not sure if it's three or five, but again, children that are not verbal, that are half bruises to these um, vulnerable places, because any hit to the face could affect your brain, your torso has all your vital organs. Um, we are supposed to be seen the same day, consult with a supervisor. Um, in my place of work, we usually take them to the doctor that same day. That one's a little harder for me. And... And you know, I there was an explanation. It sounds it sounds like they're saying they saw him do fall, and we have no reason to doubt this person at that point. So I can see how they would have just left it at that. I don't know that it was just left at that. I don't know if they had uh, that. I, they told him make sure you go to an appointment tomorrow with the primary doctor or bring him to or child abuse expert so that we can have that bruise looked at you know i don't know that that's something we we do sometimes where we say okay you know it's not an emergency they look fine right now things are going well let's just do let's just make an appointment for tomorrow morning you know that's that's something we can do and i don't know that this didn't happen it's not documented there but normally i would have given that caregiver uh <laughs> a long um talking to about you need to report any injuries any injuries that are not common you know scraped knee or you know a little bruise on the chin anything that could cause that could be a cause for concern we need to know about and even if it's just a voicemail if you can get a hold of me leave me a detailed message so that I know I need to follow up another thing that is being done at, at my county is we have to consult with a supervisor for a lot of things, we're able to consult with a senior, uh, with a senior worker. Uh, but in these situations with, with concerning bruises, we go directly to supervisor because it's a higher level of concern as to what we should do. So again, I just wanted to say, you know, a little bit of what this process is. And I don't want to give you like my final what I make of this because I want to make part two. Okay, thank you so much for spending some time with me. Bye.